Okay. You can go now. Hello, everyone. And a very, very warm welcome to the fifth event in our Astronomy on Tap Cologne version. A very warm welcome from Cologne. Hello, everyone. And today we have a very special guest to talk to us about how about stars and how big they are. So I welcome Dr. Dorothea Sechi. Uh, thanks, Dory, for joining us. Uh, and I have been given the task to introduce uh, Dr. Sechi a bit. So just to say a little bit, uh, she did her PhD from the University of Bonn. And that's actually where I first met her in 2016 in the canteen, even though none of us quite realized it when we met two years later. So after she finished her PhD, she held uh, positions as postdoctoral researcher in Prague in the Czech Academy of Sciences and in the University of Birmingham, after which she moved to University of Cologne as Alexander von Humboldt Fellow, where she has been here for the past two years. But now she is associate professor at the Nicolas Copernicus University in Torun, in Poland, which is fantastically great. And on a personal note, she is one of my favorite science speakers. So I'm very excited to see what she has to tell us about stars. For our viewers who are watching this on YouTube, if you have any questions, please uh, leave it in the comments there and we will ask your questions at the end of the talk. The talk will be 30 to 45 minutes and then we will have a short question and answer session with Dory, and then we will have an Astro News session. So I will not ramble on any longer. So Dory, the stage is all yours whenever you are ready. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Shash. It's, yeah. uh, I'm very happy to be here and I, I welcome everyone. I'm gonna share my screen and start the presentation right away. I hope you can see the screen and my presentation. So yeah, hi again, my name is Dorotia Sechi. To those who don't know me, I'm an astrophysicist and I'm originally from Hungary. So my name is a little bit too pronounced. And I just want to tell you that actually all my friends call me Dory, you know, like the fish. So yeah, if you have any questions after my talk, I'm really happy to chat and you can simply call me Dory. So uh, as I said, I'm an astrophysicist, which is kind of the combination of an astronomer and a physicist. So basically, I try to understand the physics of stars. This is why today I came here to tell you about how big stars are. Now, this is our galaxy. We call it the Milky Way. A galaxy means a lot of lots of stars and also some space dust between them. This is our sun here. Can you see this dot? So the sun is only one about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way. Some of these stars are similar to the sun, some quite different from it. Many of these stars have planets around them as well. And although today I'm not talking about planets at all, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is called Astronomy on Tap Kern, because there will be great talks later on also on planets. And there is already one uh, a few weeks ago, Sabine Graf has given a talk on extraterrestrial life on other planets around other stars. So yeah, make sure to subscribe and follow the channel for more fun videos like this. But today we are here to talk about stars and in particular to see how large they can get. This great thing here on the left is our moon. This is planet Mercury, followed by the planet Mars, which are planets in our solar system. There comes Venus and here is Earth. These are all planets, not stars, of course. Now this is Neptune, again a planet, although it consists of liquid and gas, not stone like all the smaller rocky planets before. Same is true for Saturn and Jupiter, which is the largest planet in our solar system. And this is the size of the sun. And the sun is actually not a big star at all. Sirius A is bigger and also bluer. Pollux is even larger and a bit more orange in color. And there are even larger stars than that. Arcturus is a red giant star. 
Aldebaran is an even larger red giant. And there comes another blue star, which, which is not a giant, but a super giant called Regal. And it's still not over. There comes a blue hypergiant star called the Pisto star. And there comes Antares, a red supergiant, one of the largest known. Another one of the largest is Mu Cephei, again, a red supergiant. And here is the largest known as of when this video was created, uh, V W um, V. Why Canis Major is a red hypergiant. Um, now, today we believe this is not the largest star, but back in 2013 it was. This is the size of the Earth compared to this red hypergiant star. This star has a diameter of about 2.8 billion kilometers. How can you imagine this size? Well, think of a passenger airplane flying along its surface at a normal speed of an airplane. Uh, the pilots would die, of course, but Hypothetically, it would take over a thousand years to go around this star one single time with a proper airplane. Yet this star is only a tiny dot among several hundred billion stars that form our galaxy, the Milky Way. And there are hundred billion galaxies out there apart from the Milky Way. The credit for the video goes to this YouTube channel. You can watch it again there as many times as you wish. And now that you have an idea about how large stars can get, and I'm soon going to tell you about how we astronomers can measure their size. But first, let me ask you a question. Do you think the size of a star is the same as the mass of a star? Think about it. Size versus mass. Are these the same thing? You can type your answer in the chat. I'm going to check later. <laughs> How many no's do we get? Because the right answer is no. A star can be really tiny and heavy, or it can be really large, but rather light. Of course, there are large and heavy stars and small and light stars as well. So these two things, the size of a star and the mass of a star are really not the same. When I'm talking about uh, in this talk, what I'm talking about in this talk is the size and not necessarily the mass. Okay, so let me tell you how astronomers work. How did we figure out so many things about stars? After all, all stars look like tiny dots in the sky, right? You look up at night and all you see is tiny white dots in the sky. How can we be certain that some stars are larger than others or that some are bluer or redder than others? Well, the answer is, of course, we use telescopes. And with our telescopes, we can detect the starlight and measure two things from it. The brightness of a star and the color of a star. These two things are the two most important things that we can measure about stars. Telescopes are prepared to measure these two things, for sure. Uh, now, not this kind of telescope here. Uh, this lady is a bit outdated. So this one telescope has been out of date for like two centuries ago. The most modern telescopes today look like these. For example, this one here is the largest telescope of the world that uses lenses. Its lens has a diameter of over one meter and it's in the Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin, uh, United States. Um, what about this one here? Now, this is dubbed China Sky Eye. It's in China, obviously. And it's a so-called radio telescope because it measures not the optical light, but radio waves coming from space, coming from stars. And the size of this dish is 500 meters in diameter. So like half a kilometer, that's what you see here. So this is like a huge antenna that measures radio waves from space. Uh, this here is again a radio telescope system, uh, but this time it's a whole collection of radio antennas. This system is called ELMA and it's located in the Atacama Desert. 
its power comes from the fact that all these individual antennas work together in a clever way so that we can take a look with them at the most far away stars and galaxies as well, because we combine their strength. And finally, I want to show you a space telescope because we have telescopes out in space. This one is called the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been orbiting around the Earth since 30 whole years, since 1990. And it's still up there and it's still functioning and it's still measuring and doing wonderful science. So it's one of the best instruments ever that we astronomers have built. These are only four examples, but there are countless telescopes apart from these all around the world. As you can imagine, they are complex facilities. They need hundreds of people to make any single, of one, single one of them work. All telescopes today, both those on the ground and those in space are completely computerized. So no astronomer is actually looking through a telescope anymore, like in the old days. No, today all the measurements are taken by computers and the data is analyzed by complicated software. So astronomers today need to be computer specialists and code developers. If you ask me what I do in my everyday work, well, it's rather boring. I sit next to my laptop and write computer codes. <laughs> That's it. I, I do have colleagues who sometimes travel to big telescopes to be present there while the observations are taken. But me and most astronomers and astrophysicists actually work all day long next to a computer. Sometimes all I see all day long is numbers on a screen. So as I said, the two most important things that we can measure with a telescope are the brightness and the color of a star. Brightness is pretty obvious, I think. Some stars are brighter, some are dimmer. But the color is a bit more tricky. By color, we actually mean the temperature. Like when you heat iron, first it becomes red, and then when it's even hotter, it becomes blue. Same thing here. The hotter a star, the bluer it is. So from these two informations, color and brightness, we can easily figure out the size of a star. That is the physical extent and not the mass. The mass is another issue completely, topic for another talk probably. But the size of a star can be figured out by using this diagram. The brightness here is presented on the vertical axis and the color on the horizontal axis. So let's say you have a telescope and you measure a star's brightness and color. Let's say your star has a yellow color here. And let's say that it is something like middle bright, like one of these stars here. Yellow color, middle bright, brightness. These are stars similar to our sun. So our sun is over here and there are stars around it that are similar to it. Uh, the sun is a yellow star, which is not very bright, but not very dim either. It is a rather average looking star. But what if your star is dimmer than the sun and rather white or blue? Then it's a so-called white dwarf, which are these things here. What if uh, your star is a white blue star, but very bright? Then it's probably a white supergiant like Regal up here. Uh, I think Germans call it Regal and English people call it Rigel. I'm not very sure about how to properly pronounce the name, it's probably Arabic in origin. So I, I'm gonna just call it Regal all the time. And sorry if uh, some, some people know a better pronunciation. So what else do we have here on this diagram? Remember Arcturus? We have seen it before. Uh, Arcturus is um, orange or reddish super giant, uh, um, giant, not super giant, sorry, giant. And Antares is here, which is already a red supergiant. Now, if you, play, if you pay close attention to this diagram, you can see that the brighter and cooler a star, the larger its size becomes. So the larger stars are found in the top right corner of the diagram, while those 
down here are usually called dwarfs because they are smaller in size. The largest star on this diagram uh, that is presented is Betelgeuse, which is a very famous red supergiant star, although the video, the, the video before did not mention it, unfortunately. But Betelgeuse is uh, the shoulder of Orion. Have you heard about Orion? The famous hunter on the sky? You can see it, in fact, yourself if you go out tonight. This time of the year, Orion is up on the sky at late night. And this is how it looks like from Earth. So if you look up on a clear night where there is no clouds in the sky, you can check out Orion for yourself. This is what you should look for. Now, I understand that this may be difficult. If you have never looked at any constellation on the, on the night sky before, it may not be easy to find Orion at first. Fortunately, modern technology is for the rescue. There are apps for your cell phone that can help. Do a search for stargazing app. And there are many options you can choose from and you can try many apps. And these will tell you where to look on the sky and what you should look for and what you should expect to see. That's the greatest, greatest thing. Try it after this talk is over. Just bring your cell phone, go out tonight and download the app one of the, these um, stargazing apps and check out the sky for yourself. Now, I mentioned that there are space telescopes out there, remember? If you could go out to space where there is nowhere, this is, sorry, that was gonna be the advertisement for the, for the app. And this is how Orion would look like from space. Out there, there is no atmosphere. So the starlight is much clearer. The air uh, unfortunately absorbs some of the light that comes from the stars. This is why we like space telescopes very much because they can give us a much clearer view. Here is Betelgeuse, the one I mentioned before, the one on the top right corner of the diagram. This is a really, really large red supergiant star. And here is Rigel or Rigel. If you remember, that was mentioned before a couple of times, it's a white or, or bluish supergiant star, the foot of Orion. And of course, Orion is famous for its belt, which is these three stars that seems to be aligned, that seem to be aligned forming the belt of the hunter. Here is a drawing. As you can see, this is why people in ancient times when they looked up on the sky thought it was a hunter because it kind of looks like a hunter. Uh, it kind of looks like he's hunting with a bow and arrow, at least if you have a vivid imagination. <laughs> so at winter evenings when the, sky is, when the sky is clear, look at south, southeast. You see Orion with his two dogs, the big dog, down here and the small dog here. The big dog's brightest star is called Sirius and the small dog's brightest star is called Procyon. You know, Sirius has been my favorite star since I was 10 years old, at least. It's actually the brightest star on, uh, brightest star on, the, on the sky. And you know, when I was a child, we did not have yet smartphones. Okay, I sound like an old lady now, I'm only 32, but it's true that back in the days when I first fell in love with the stars and astronomy, I could not use a smartphone, I didn't have one. If I wanted to find a star on the sky, say Sirius, I had to first get a sky map, like a proper map, you know, a book or something. I couldn't just Google things, I had to go to a proper library and borrow a book. And if I wanted to learn about stars, that's how I could do it. So yeah, today things are simpler, at least in this regard. And do you know that when you look at a star, at any star, the light that you see has left the star several thousand years ago, at least. Just think about it. The light that travels uh, the, the light, sorry, light travels with a given speed. 
it's called the speed of light, right? Which means that if it has to travel a long way, a very long way, it will take time to reach its destination. So the light that leaves Sirius will need to travel for about 9,000 years to reach us. This means that when you look at a star, you look into the past. That's instant time travel for you. If we go back to this image you see from space of Orion, can you see this shady region here below the belt? It's called Orion Nebula. A nebula is basically a huge amount of gas out there in space. It is colorful, kind of, because it is irradiated by, by starlight. Orion Nebula is a, is a place where stars are born. Remember this name, you'll see it again in a bit. And now that you have an idea about the size of the biggest star, let's watch another video. Because there are things in the universe that are even larger than stars, and I'm gonna show you some of them. In fact, here you see a few stars that you have seen before. So for example, Regal is there, the, 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 the white thing. And let's play the video then. Uh, here is Antares, for example, and some other red supergiants. And here is the distance of the Neptune's orbit around the sun. And here is the distance that light can travel during one day. So this is called the light day. And here is a black hole for you. This is a giant black hole. It has a name, as you can see, S5014 plus 81. Now, astronomers decided to give weird names to space objects at some point because there are so many objects out there including stars and black holes and nebulae and, and, and all those things, galaxies, that we simply could not come up with names anymore. So at some point we just started to dub all the new found objects with some catalog number and this is why this black hole is called S5 etc etc. And now we have some nebulae. All these things are already much larger than any known star. So these are nebulae, which are beautiful, lighten up objects out there and they are usually very colorful. And some of them are the birthplaces of stars. Here is the size of a light year. This, this is the distance that light travels in one year. So if you had a um, spaceship that could bring you somewhere with the speed of light, you would need one whole year to travel this distance. And there are things that are larger than that, of course. So here we have some other nebulae, the Helix Nebulae, for example, the Ring Nebulae. Oh, and there is the distance from the sun to Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to the sun. So this is the distance of the close, but closest star to Earth, practically. So if you wanted to go there to the next star, you would need to travel for more than a year, even if you could travel with the speed of light, which is already impossible. So you cannot travel with the speed of light. That's, that, that's completely out of question. Uh, the laws of physics doesn't allow it. But if you could, you would need several years to get there to the closest star, not to talk about all the rest of the universe. And let's move on because I believe Orion Nebula is coming up soon. Yes, exactly. So this is Orion Nebula, the one I mentioned before, below the belt of the hunter. It looks like that. And it's a place where stars are born so it's like a giant gas, like space dust out there. 
and stars are forming out of this space dust all the time, constantly. So this is a really exciting place to observe and take pictures of and really just study scientifically because stars are constantly forming there and we can study the process of star formation in this nebula. So we have some more nebulae coming up. And after that, oh, there, there comes another, a larger nebula, I believe. Yes, Tarantula Nebula. That's also very famous and very important scientifically. So many of my close colleagues study the Tarantula Nebula, for example. And this is the Small Magellanic Cloud, the famous Small Magellanic Cloud, which, which is already a galaxy. It consists of 100 billions of stars and it's a so-called dwarf galaxy. And above that size, we already have galaxies, many, many galaxies, as you will soon see. So these here are spiral galaxies with beautiful spiral arms. The Milky Way is one of them. This is how it would look like if you could take a look at it from the outside. Of course you cannot, but this is like an imaginary picture of the Milky Way, uh, how it would look like if you could travel out, outside of it. And there are some other spiral galaxies around it. For example, the Andromeda galaxy, which is even larger than the Milky Way. And uh, with, even with a smaller, even with a small telescope, the one you can buy in the shop, you can kind of see the Andromeda galaxy on the sky um, so yeah, if you have one of those small telescopes, you can already see it as like a shady region, a shady white region on the sky. Not like this, because this is a picture from the Hubble Space, Space Telescope again. So you would see it if you could go, you know, to a, a space station, but you can still take a look, a very dim look if you have a smaller telescope. Um, yeah. And so after that, here is an elliptical galaxy. This one is much larger than those before, and it has no spiral arms anymore. It's called an elliptical galaxy because it's kind of spherical and it has no spiral arms. And it also doesn't have a name. So it just have a catalog number. It's called IC1101. That's its name, sorry. Um, yeah, but it's larger and it contains even more stars. And there are so many of these out there. The whole universe is full of galaxies. Uh, now, this is the local group, which is a collection of all these galaxies that we saw before and some more. And the, and the rest of the dots that you see right now, all of them are galaxies, not stars, okay? So one white dot is one, ga one galaxy from now on. This is just for you to imagine the size of the universe out there. It's called a, a supercluster complex, which means a congregation of galaxies and galaxy clusters. And moving on, we will soon see some more galaxy complexes, this shades and at the end of the day, this is the whole observable universe that we can ever hope to see. So yeah, um, credit for the video goes, for, goes to this YouTube channel again. You can go and watch it again as many times as you want. And some final words. Please remember that our little planet Earth is a pre precious thing that we have to protect and take good care of because the universe is vast and huge and we are a small cute thing compared to what's out there. We have this one planet to live on and if studying the stars during my life as an astrophysicist taught me anything, it was that we are on this Earth just a tiny fragment of the vast universe and we need to rely on each other and work together for our survival because there is no other planet, no other star like the sun. 
Um, okay, that's not technically true. There are many stars like the sun, but they are so far away that it's not possible to go there. It's just simply not possible. So we have to protect the only planet that we have. Okay, more or less unlearned. This is where I stop. Make sure to try, to try a stargazing app tonight. And I was really happy to be here today and I'm excited to answer any questions. If you have, please type them in the chat. And thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot, Dory, for this fantastic talk. I will clap for the audience since this is one of the sad things about having a virtual event that we it's more difficult to appreciate. So it was really, really, really fascinating and a fantastic talk. Thanks a lot for agreeing uh, to give this to us. So we will have a look at the questions in the chat. Uh, but before that, if you're watching on YouTube, do subscribe to our social media channels. They will be in the description of the video itself. So I start uh, with the questions from the chat. So uh, Sophia Taylor asks, I'm just curious about the black hole in uh, in size comparison. Is that in the center of a galaxy? Uh, so that particular black hole is probably a center of a galaxy, but not the Milky Way, I believe. I believe the Milky Way's central black hole is smaller than that. However, please note that the size you saw there is not the black hole itself. It's the event, so-called event horizon around it, because we cannot see the black hole itself. Light cannot come out from a black hole. Once it's entered it, it cannot come out, so we cannot see anything coming out of a black hole, not even light. But the thing that you saw is the last surface around the black hole from where light can still come out and reach us. And so this is not the actual size of a black hole, it's the size of this so-called event horizon. The black hole itself is, is, is really, it's, it's like impossibly tiny. <laughs> I mean, it's a singularity, right? It's technically. A, yeah. yeah, mathematically or it's a singularity math yeah. and physically we just really don't know <laughs> or like, right. we have no idea. Yeah, um, yeah. thanks a lot. So uh, Vaftrudnir the seer asks, so what about multiverse? I guess this was when you showed the observable universe and said, so probably your opinion, or I don't know what <laughs> comments you might have on this. Well, the multiverse is a theory. We have no observational proof of its existing. It's sci-fi at this point. I, I love sci-fi. I have no problem with sci-fi, but it's not science yet. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's technically not observable, it's it's a bit yeah. in the edge, right? It's, yeah, right. it's just a theory. Okay, so there is another question, which is where in Germany or Europe is it actually best to observe the Milky Way and other galaxies? Oof, well, Western Europe in general is not the best. It's really light polluted. Light pollution means that it's usually there are lots of street lights, and so you cannot really see uh, the night sky very well. If you go to Eastern Europe, the situation is usually better, at least far away from larger cities. If you go to um, the, the mountains or the, the forest or something in Eastern Europe, that's a great place. So the, the sky is usually much clearer from there uh, in Europe. You know, you can always go to more exotic places, probably not during Corona, but, you know, in general. <laughs> But yeah, that's true. In yeah, Germany, always. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Shash? In Germany, yeah. it's difficult, right? Cologne is always yeah, so cloudy, it's <laughs> and it's cloudy, of course. Yeah. yeah, that is really a difficult. In Germany, I I really don't know what would be. No, the best me neither. But well, far away from cities and, and and street lights, that's the best. Yeah. Uh, if I can add sure. a comment on, on that, uh, close to oh. us here in the area of Cologne, I know, mm -hmm. but. In the middle of Eiffel National Park, you can have a uh, okay. good um, you okay in comparison of the deserts in Iran. You cannot <laughs> yes, <of laughs> have a good uh, view, but a good sky. But still, it's fascinating for mm. us. And we spend some nights there. Uh, it's nice. 
I would say. You can uh, see the um, Milky Way and also Andromeda with uh, naked eyes. Oh, so, even with naked eye, yeah. Yeah, so I would say it, it has a good Okay. Set. Okay, there's your nearest uh, destination to watch the night sky. The Eiffel National Park, yeah. yeah. Great. Good idea. Yeah. Great idea. Armin Emmert asks, uh, Dori, when you sometimes look at numbers on the screen all day long, is just a regular chore or do you make exciting discoveries sometimes? <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a funny question. It's usually like an everyday chore, but sometimes there are discoveries. Yeah, I don't know how often, a couple of times per year, I guess. Depends on the size of the discovery, like big discoveries, quite rarely maybe yeah. once per year or something smaller discoveries like realizations more often yeah maybe once in a month or once in two months or something like that i i personally had a question related to that to you which is that you know we when we are uh, younger we often feel very fascinated when we watch these astrophysical pictures and these skills and it's very humbling and beautiful but in your daily life as working as an astronomer do you still retain this fascination or do you feel it's more like a chore or do you sometimes have this feeling still or you know what I mean I, I know what you mean yes um, I don't think I have it every day it's such a powerful feeling that you it, it's impossible to have it every day but for example, when I give public outreach talks like this, I usually feel it again because it's really exciting to talk about it to people and to share this. And, and I, I usually feel very excited about it the, on these, these rare occasions. But in, in my everyday work, it's, um, it's usually just work. You know, I like it. I like it very much. I really enjoy doing science and doing physics and astrophysics, but I don't feel the fascination all the time. It's, I think it's impossible, like humanly impossible to feel. I think. Yeah. Yeah. If you feel it every day, probably it doesn't carry the same impact. Yeah, right? exactly. Unfortunately, yeah. it's still <laughs> a nice life. It's still a great life. <laughs> Please become an astronomer if you're young enough to, to start your studies. It, it's a great thing. That is true. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, D. Bergers asks, hi there, I would like to ask Dory about the properties of the black holes to accelerate the flow of time. <laughs> All right. Um, well, you should really ask someone else. I'm not the right person, I guess. I have read and I have studied a little bit about, I have read about black holes and studied them a little bit, but I'm really not an expert on black holes. I'm an expert on stars. Um, accelerating time. Uh, well, yeah, if you go close enough to a black hole, time, your time changes really. Like, yeah, watch the, the movie Interstellar. It's a great explanation. It has a great explanation and it's a great movie. So just go and watch that one. Um, yeah, but please come back to one of the next talks later on on this channel, because I'm sure there will be some talks about black holes later on. You can ask the same question to a real expert. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, always in general, black holes are fascinating. But I, I guess the point of the series is also to show that there are many exciting topics in black holes, not just, uh, sorry, in astrophysics, not just black holes, but stars themselves can be really fascinating and um, really exciting as well. So I, on, on this note, maybe a bit more on a personal side, I wanted to ask you, so I remember you said about looking at scars, sc uh, looking at the sky when you were a 10 year old, but what was it this that got you interest in, interested in astrophysics? Why did you decide to become an astrophysicist and mm -hmm. why particularly stars? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think what did it for me was Orion's belt. At least that's one of my oldest memories, looking at Orion's belt, like the, 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 three, the three stars well aligned. It was just beautiful and fascinating. And I was, I was probably like a kindergarten age. And I was like, that's great. That's wonderful. I love it. I, I must be an astronomer. I don't know. Uh, and then you know, uh, life happened and I became one. But yeah, I think it was Orion's belt. 
wow. for me. Probably. From kindergarten, that is simply amazing. That is yeah, wow. but you know, I hear it a lot, like from mm -hmm. other astronomers. Uh, when I hear them talk about their experiences, it's it's a common theme that mm -hmm. many astronomers wanted to become one since kindergarten. That's a, that's a thing. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I, I guess astrophysics does have this also very visual appeal, um, apart from also the physical intri intricacies, which make it very interesting. Yeah. And exciting so i think in the chat we do not have any further questions the burgers uh says that about his question about accelerating that it came from the movie interstellar okay right so, thank you so <laughs> sorry um, yeah right um craig has a question he wants to ask are all stars perfect spheres or are there inhomogeneity Wow, that's a great question. Um, so most stars are spherical. Uh, there are some exceptions. So for example, if a star happens to rotate, because sometimes stars actually rotate, like Earth rotates, you know, and the sun rotates as well. And all stars rotate at some extent. Some rotate very slowly, some rotate rather fast. And if it rotates really fast, then it will become oblate, right? Because the centrifugal force will uh, change its shape. So those regions around the equator will become larger in extent, while those in the pole will shrink in a little bit, like, you know, like due to the centrifugal force, basically. So we do have oblate, rather a ob little bit oblate stars. Um, we also do have, so some of the red supergiants that I mentioned before, that I showed you before a few of them. So these are so large that their surface is not exactly spherical. So it, like, mm, how to say, like there are some divergence from, from sphericity. So it's like uh, this, this moving big blob actually. Um, yeah, th there are observational evidence that some red giants are not perfectly spherical. So yeah, we have weird stars. That's true. That, that is really interesting that, yeah. Okay, I didn't think, I didn't know that the red giants can be so wobbly. Yeah, wobbly. they are already so like popped up, like puffed up that, that they cannot really keep the strict sphericity. So their, their surface will like move around a bit. Yeah. Wow, well, that, that is really interesting. That's the thing. The Burgers has another question. They ask, uh, could you tell me something about the Pleiades of Pleiades? I actually never know how to correctly pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, so it's an um, Pleiades, Pleiades. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I'm sorry. It's, um, it's an open cluster. It's an open star cluster. It's rather close to us. Um, um, so star clusters are are places where many stars are close to each other. So the sun is an isolated star. It is not really part of any stellar cluster. It's, it's just there. But sometimes stars congregate uh, next close to each other in large numbers. And this is what we call a stellar cluster. And there are various types of star clusters, but this Pleiades, Pleiades is an so-called open cluster. It's stars that were probably born from the, from the same cloud, from the same uh, nebula, and they are still close to each other because they were born from the same cloud. And yeah, um, what what is the question? Like, can, I think what, they just wanted to know a bit more. There was yeah, no you can see it on the sky. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think it's in Taurus, in the constellation Taurus. So uh, yeah, just, you know, your cell phone, your app, and look it up. And you will find it in, in the constellation Ta Taurus, which is also up on the night sky. So you can possibly see it tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another great resource, this reminds me, so there's also something called the ESA sky map, which you can look up and there you can search different objects and also mm -hmm. gives fantastic pictures that can be kind of complementary with. Yeah, sure. Um, Sophia Taylor comments on your comment on that the surface is not spherical, that they're like popcorn stars. I rather like <laughs> it. 
That's analogy. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So the burgers further ask about um, yes. the players, that how big they are and how far. New file of the conference. I will send it around tomorrow. Okay. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Um, can uh, Ignacio? Can you mute? Oh, I cannot mute. Uh, oh. yeah. So the uh, the burgers, I think, asked about the Pleiades, that how big they are. So I guess the open cluster and oh, okay. how far away. So Ooh. That's a question for Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember the details. No, I don't remember by heart. Yeah. It's impossible to remember all these facts. Um, I can look it up for you uh, on Wikipedia, but you can look it up for yourself. We, as well. we can write it as an answer in the Yeah, chat. we will write it later in the chat. Yeah. yeah, thanks. But also if you simply Google. Sorry, that. I don't I don't know by heart. Yeah, but I think that's another lesson, right? That we do not exactly remember all the facts. Mm -hmm. We use the facts to kind of look beyond it. Yes, yeah. exactly. But um, yeah. So I think we do not have more questions. I would like to finish with um, one final question for you, which is that, so if we have um, anybody who is young enough to maybe pursue astronomy or would maybe even like to be an amateur astronomer, or amateur mm -hmm. astrophysicist. So do you have any advice for uh, somebody who is interested in astrophysics, but maybe doesn't quite know how to get into it so much? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's always possible to become an amateur astronomer, which means that you feel enthusiastic about stars and you just buy your own telescope. It doesn't need to be large. It doesn't need to be as large as I, that I showed you before. Like, those are like scientific telescopes, but you can buy a small one for yourself that you can use in your garden or on your balcony uh, to, or, or, you know, you go to a mountain, you go to the mountains and, 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 and observe stars from there where the sky is clear and you can always become an amateur astronomer. Uh, you can self teach yourself about these things. There are so many resources online. You can learn everything about stars and constellations and planets as well. You can observe planets with your telescope. These, these are great things like to, to go and observe Saturn, for example, with its rings, with a, with a small telescope. So the telescope can be that large, like not larger than that. And you can already see Saturn and its rings and Jupiter and its moons around, like the moons around it. It's, it's beautiful, it's, it's cute, it's really great. So please do that, even if you don't decide to become a, like a professional astronomer. And if you want to become a professional astronomer, make sure you study math and physics, make sure that you like those subjects because they will be very important later on and make sure you like informatics, like programming and code development because it's almost impossible to, to become an astronomer without that in these days. As I said, we, we usually work with codes and, and computers all the time. So these are the, the three subjects that you really need to uh, be happy with. And yeah, just go and study physics at university level and there will probably be a chance once you get admitted to physics that, to, to pursue a research topic in astronomy and become an astronomer later on. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah. that, that's the, the path. Yeah, that's true. I mean, nothing, you know, is very simple, right? If you, of you course. need to work hard. Yeah. You need to work hard and you need to study hard and you need to be very good in it. And yeah, but it's great and it, it's a wonderful life. And I, I'm really happy with it. So yeah, I, I, I did say it will be the last question. But as I was saying it, there was another question in YouTube. And since we are quite with time, I would ask this as well. Uh, so it's from Yash Busare and he asks, how do we measure the mass of clusters? Since we talked about clusters, I guess a bit. Mm. <laughs> well, um, the mass of clusters, not stars, right? That was a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so practically, 
if the cluster is close enough to us, you can follow the path of stars inside the cluster. So in a cluster, stars move around all the, all the time. If they didn't, they would just fall in and, and merge. But they don't do that because they move around. They are on orbit. They are constantly, like randomly, like doing this kind of motion. And if we follow the motion of all these stars, it is possible to figure out the, the total mass of the cluster just by measuring the motion and computing, like basically describing the motion and computing the right physics equations. Uh, so that's one way. For clusters that are further away that we cannot possibly have enough measurements in a human lifetime to follow the path of individual stars, we can still like estimate the, the mass of the cluster by measuring the light coming from all the stars. Because the light that's coming from the stars is, um, is, is, a, is, is, a, is, is proportional to the mass of those stars. So the more massive the star, the more light it emits. Therefore, if you measure the total light coming from a cluster, you can have an estimate, a good enough estimate for the mass of the cluster. I hope that yeah. that's a yeah, I, I think that's good explanation. quite a comprehensive answer. So, okay. Then with that, we had a very nice discussion. Thanks again. Thank for, you so uh, much. Thank you thanks. so much for having me and for this Thanks for giving the talk. If we met in person, we would have bought you a drink um, at, at the actual <laughs> bar, but maybe that can wait until next time when after the pandemic, when we can have uh, live events as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so with that, I thank again Dory and I clap for us all. And uh, we will now have an Astro News session where we discuss what happened in the past month. So in the YouTube, uh, please uh, feel free to stay because there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. And Dory would also love if you would stay as well. Um, and then I would hand over to Vina who will present uh, what happened in astrophysics in the last month. Thanks, Shashwat. Hope I am audible to you. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Okay. So hope you are able to see my screen. Yes. Um, so I will present some of the interesting astronomy news that has been published last month and uh, this month as well. So first we start with the detection of first ever fast radio burst within the Milky Way. So just to give a brief introduction about FRBs, they are high energy radio transient burst, which is having a duration of roughly few milliseconds. But in this short time span, they produce energy equivalent to the solar energy produced in three days. So it's a very high energy phenomena, and it has been discovered for the first time in 2007. And the first FRB is known as the Lorimer burst. So uh, these being such a short time scale event, they are re really difficult to be detected. And also this make it uh, very uh, hard to pinpoint the exact location of these FRBs. So since their discovery in 2007, at least 40 FRBs or a few more than 40 has been detected so far and all of them being extragalactic FRBs. And the closest is roughly 490 million light years away. So the origin of FRBs uh, is uh, under speculation and a lot of theories have been proposed to explain them, most of them invoking some kind of a stellar remnant, such as a neutron star or black hole or a magnetar, which is a magnetized neutron star. So uh, in April this year, the KIME and STAIR-2 radio telescope facilities has detected a new FRB known as FRB200428 towards the galactic center region in our Milky Way. And it has been uh, positionally associated with the galactic magnetar SGR 1935 plus 2154. 
So this magnetar is located roughly 30,000 light years away from us. So simultaneously, many space telescopes and detectors have also identified X-ray bursts towards this particular magnetar. So this is pretty interesting. This is the first time when uh, there is a multi-wavelength counterpart for the FRB simultaneously. So uh, at least for now, we know that the uh, there is few of the F FRBs being uh, likely to have association with the magnetar. But many of the extragalactic FRBs have energy levels much greater than that of the one detected here. And few FRBs are also repetitive in nature. So we don't know really what other mechanisms could produce such radio burst, but magnetars definitely have some role in producing FRBs. The exact theoretical mechanism is still unknown, but this is a, a small uh, clue towards understanding the FRBs in the future. Next is the discovery of a first Earth-sized habitable zone exoplanet discovered using TESS. So TOI 700D is one of the three small planets orbiting an M-type white dwarf, uh, M dwarf star, which is located at 102 light years away from us. So this has been discovered using TESS, which is transiting exoplanet survey satellite exclusively for uh, discovering exoplanets using transient method. So they identified this planet around the dwarf star TOI 700, and they confirmed this detection um, with further infrared observations. Uh, this planet, it's a rocky planet and it is tidally locked with the star, which means that one of the uh, planet, one side of the planet is permanently facing the parent star and the other side is always dark. So the orbit of this planet is in habitable zone of the parent star which means that there is a possibility of finding liquid water on the surface of this planet. And also the stellar wind ramp pressure and interplanetary magnetic field towards this particular planet is similar to that of Earth, which means that it's a high possibility that there is an atmosphere uh, in this planet. But since it is tidally locked with the star, it is a, uh, likely that the climatic conditions in this planet is completely different from that of Earth. So with the current facilities, astronomers are not able to uh, study the atmosphere of this planet, but they do hope that with future advanced facilities, one day they will get impo more information about this atmosphere towards T TOI 700D and they can compare it with the uh, simulations and models to get a better picture about this planet. Next is an interesting news about an um, early universe supermassive black hole association with a proto cluster, uh, proto galaxy cluster. So astronomers discovered a giant black hole surrounded by six proto galaxies using the very large telescope, which is an array of four uh, telescopes in the Atacama Desert. This black hole having a weight of roughly a billion solar mass powers a quasar SDSS J1030 plus 0524. And it also have six proto galaxies. So this was at an era when the universe was just 900 million years old. So this discovery is important to understand the origin of galaxy clusters and cosmic web, and also the evolution of supermassive black holes. Because one question remains that how these supermassive black holes get such an enormous amount of fuel to grow into their present size. So these galaxies uh, are one of the faintest group of galaxies mapped so far, and this will give important information for the astronomers. Next news is about a cometary activity spotted on a distant centaur. So centaurs are minor planets in Kuiper belt or outer solar system. 
So they, their semi-major axis is uh, between the outer planets and they have really highly unstable orbits. So centaurs are rather a mix between asteroids and comets. So they have a rocky composition like an asteroid, but at the same time, they emit gas and vapor in their tails like a comet. So they have been named after the mythological creatures, uh, creature centaur, which is a mix of horse and a human. Uh, so astronomers propose that there are at least 50,000 to 10 million centaurs present in the outer solar system, which are of kilometer size scales. And uh, since their discovery in 1927, only 18 centaurs have been found to be uh, showing some kind of activity. And one of them is Centaur 2014 OG392. And shown here in the right side is an image from Lowell Discovery Telescope. Uh, so you can clearly see the core of the Centaur and its diffuse comma or tail uh, like structure. So the comma is extended to 400,000 kilometers. So this activity associated with the Centaur is thought to be sublimation processes of carbon monoxide or ammonia. So this large scale activity associated with 2014 OG392 has forced astronomers to reclassify this center as a comet. Next news is about the detection of cyclopropanilidine molecule in the atmosphere of Titan. So Titan is one of the largest uh, moons in the solar system and it's the largest moon of Saturn. It's particularly interesting because Titan is the only moon having a dense atmosphere in a solar system. So its atmosphere mainly comprises of nitrogen, methane, ethane, and hydrogen. Um, it is having a rocky core and an ice crust, but it is also believed to have ammonia rich uh, liquid water in its subsurface. So uh, Atacama large millimeter array spectroscopic observations towards Titan has led to the detection of this particular molecule, the C3H2 molecule. So why this, this is important? Because uh, cyclopropanilidine is not a common molecule. It has been detected only in few of the gas clouds in our Milky Way, such as the Taurus molecule molecular cloud, and it's the first time that it is detected in an atmosphere. And this is the only cyclic molecule other than benzene discovered in Titan. Such cyclic molecules are really, really important because they are crucial for the formation of biological molecules like RNA and DNA. So, Chemical, uh, astrochemical studies towards Titan is really important because it's a real life laboratory to observe the chemical activity similar to that provided in ancient Earth. Next is something about uh, detection or the confirmation of water on lunar surface by SOFIA. SOFIA is the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It's a NASA's flying observatory, and uh, it uses a American German aircraft. And it's the first time confirmation of water molecule on sunlit surface of the moon. So the observations were carried out using SOFIA faint object array, uh, faint object infrared array camera. And water molecule has been detected near the Clavius crater, which is the largest crater, one of the largest crater in moon. So previously, uh, many facilities have detected signature of water, but it was not confirmed. Uh, they have identified infrared absorption lines, which can be attributed to either hydrogen, uh, sorry, water or hydroxyl molecule. But with SOFIA, they were clearly able to identify a six micrometer emission line, which is a clear signature of water. So this is completely surprising and challenges our understanding of lunar surface because previously it has been thought that water molecule is present only towards the colder regions of lunar surface. 
but now it's detected in sunlit side as well. So it's believed that maybe the water molecules are either um, hidden between the grains uh, or on the surface, or it's present in a bead-like structure. So it's shadowed from the uh, harsh sunlight. Uh, so LIGO Virgo collaboration has announced 39 new gravitational wave signals. So in their third observing run, this is pretty exciting because uh, in the last two observational runs, they have detected only 11 events, but now it's more than uh, like quadrupled detection in last six months, which make the total events to be 50. So the new surge in this detection is attributed to 60% improvement in the detector sensitivity as well as uh, more operation time without any interruption. So this many number of uh, new gravitational wave events will provide astronomers a plethora of data to work with, which will give uh, important clues towards understanding the merger events. So uh, before uh, uh, winding up, I would like to present a beautiful image of the Skull Nebula, also known as NGC 246. So uh, taken with the uh, very large telescope of uh, European Southern Observatory. So they released this image uh, last week. So this is a planetary nebula, which is located at a distance of 1,600 light years. And you can clearly see the central white dwarf in the image. And this white dwarf also has a binary companion star, which is not visible in the image. But also the binary is orbited by a third outer star. So this is the first non-planetary nebula with a triple stellar system at its center. Uh, this uh, nebula is also known as the Pactan Nebula by some astronomers because of its similarity with this Pac-Man game structure. <laughs> so if you are interested to read more about uh, these uh, discoveries, you can have a look at the links given below uh, here. And uh, I would also like to announce that our next AOT colon event will be in February next year. So we will update about the details of the next event in our social media pages. So do visit our Instagram and Facebook pages for more information. With that, I will stop and thank you. Uh, thanks a lot Vin, for the really nice um, update on what has been up in astronomy and seems to be quite a lot. And um, yeah, I think to end with the, with the Skull Nebula is also a great note since it also corresponds to what Dori was showing to us in her talks. So thanks to all our viewers who have been watching. And then if, there are, if there's anything else, right, we will answer. If not, again, uh, thanks you all. Thanks to Dori, thanks to Vina, and we will end this session here.